this is us on the A380 business class of Malaysia Airlines. Um, I'm in the front row seat, which is uh, 9A. You can see from the design of the seat uh, that it's very different from the one that we saw earlier on the other flight check on the A350. Uh, what you do get, though, is a lot of space. Uh, not surprisingly, even though on the upper, we're on the upper deck of the A380, there's more space than the A350. Um, we're in a 222 configuration, which is, uh, you know, very generous uh, for an aircraft of this size. Um, and it's one that uh, means that when you're fully reclined, other than the fact that you have to step over the person uh, inside you if you're in a window seat and this, the um, aisle seat is occupied, um, really has few downsides. One of the big pluses also is the fact that you've got loads and loads of storage, particularly in the window seats, because uh, you've got these side storage units. So it's a very comfortable aircraft, and it's um, in many ways a shame that the A380 seems to be uh, not finding favour with airlines, because it's certainly popular with passengers. But what I'm taking a picture of here at the moment is, um, other than my laptop, which is that big white screen you can see there on the seat next to me, the front row of um, this business class cabin. What you've got to notice is that, as well as these two main seats, two um, centre seats, uh, being in front of the two washrooms, and you can see one washroom door there, you've also got the problem that people even when there are people sitting in those seats, tend to use it as a cut through rather than going through the galley. So you can be quite happily sitting there and someone will realize that one washroom is taken and whip through uh, row nine to get to the other washroom. So really, generally, row nine is one to avoid. I've chosen it on this occasion, A, because I'm not in the front row and, um, well, not in the middle seats, and also because uh, there's no one inside me, which is why I can do something like put the laptop next to me and make videos like this without disturbing anyone. You have to admire a panel like that. All of those controls are just to set the seat. And then below it, which is quite dark, I don't know if you can see it, is the controls for the in-flight entertainment system. It's probably too dark. Oh, there we go. There you can see it. So if you look at that one and then that, you have to say to yourself, there's no way you're going to get bored, even on a 13-hour flight like this one. You just play around the seat for six or seven hours. There is nothing that beats the amount of storage that you get on the upper deck if you've got a window seat. I mean, in this seat here I've got uh, one, but I've also got a second one where I could put my whole bag as well. Thank you. As you can see, you also get a choice of drink, so you get champagne, orange juice, and uh, the amenity bag has been delivered, and the menu is waiting at the seat. You can see the serving satay even though um, we're not allowed hot beverages. It always seems to be bumpy coming out of KL. Thank you. The only thing I can say in defence of the satay is that it is so much nicer to taste than it is to look at. I know this looks like a complete mess, but uh, it's absolutely delicious and I'm really looking forward to it. Which is strange because it's only about 35 minutes since I had my last meal. It's the menu for this evening or late night flight. It starts off, as you'd expect, with the Malaysian satay. And then you've got um, a supper, and that's marinated prawn with beetroot for a starter, or cauliflower cream soup. And then the main courses are braised beef rib, ayam masak lemak, which is a traditional Malaysian dish, pan-roasted garupa, or kung pao tofu. Actually, that sounds lovely, especially since I've had a lot of meat. And then the desserts are the chocolate brownie, ice cream, fruit, cheese. There's also um, a dine anytime menu, which is really useful on a long flight like this, of egg noodles, sandwiches, and then before landing, a uh, breakfast menu. Breakfast time, or I think they call it second meal or breakfast time. Let's see what's on the menu. I'll get it here for you. Um, it is, yeah, before landing. Full breakfast served 90 minutes before landing. Choices fruit smoothie, seasonal fruit, cereal, 
which is cornflakes or muesli, with low fat or full cream milk, for those who just don't care. Bakery selection, nasi lemak. Now that's the uh, Malaysian dish, and I have to say I had it on the way over, I thought it was delicious. It's uh, fragrant rice cooked in coconut milk and pandan leaves, served with chicken rendang, onion sambal, and traditional accompaniments. Um, I just think they do it you know, very well. If you choose a national cuisine on a national airline, it's probably the best way of choosing what the food's like. But alternatively, you could have mushroom omelette, which is beef sausage, parmentier potatoes, braised beans, and spinach, or Belgian waffles. Which ought to keep us going for the next couple of hours, since it's about two hours since I last ate. Uh, I had the, um, the egg noodles earlier on. And the egg noodles and vegetable-based soup with shredded chicken, prawns, bean curd, fish balls and Asian greens. I ate that uh, sometime in the middle of the night and then went straight back to sleep again, which is uh, some kind of form of luxury, I suppose. Um, the flight in general has been uh, excellent. I've had lots of room. It's been very quiet in the cabin. This is the fruit. I've got a Nestle yogurt. No advertising. Should I have a bread? Oh, lovely. What have you got? I've got uh, blueberry Danish, toast, croissant. Um, I'll have a Danish, please. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. And this is the nasi lemak, which I'm having for breakfast. Isn't it great what different uh, nations and nationalities eat for breakfast? I mean, I get the egg, but, you know, cucumber and rice. Delicious, though. I think one thing I um, normally neglect on these reviews is to talk about the in-flight entertainment system. It's partly because I just don't do anything with it. Um, I tend to either uh, work, record nonsense like this, or um, or sleep. Um, you know, this has been a sort of 33, 34 hour round trip of flying to and from Kuala Lumpur. So for me, you know, trying out the food, having a look at the seat, but then also getting some sleep was the most important thing. I also think, to be fair, that a lot of business travellers are pretty similar. Um, if you fly a lot, you see the few films you do want to see, and after that you're really just killing time. And I've always felt, found that if you do watch films, it, it stops you sleeping. Obviously it stops you sleeping while you're watching them, but then, um, you know, afterwards as well. Uh, overstimulating would be the way I put it. So I tend to bring a few books and things that I need to catch up on the reading and uh, fall asleep for most of the flight if I can. I think one of the justifications for that is that if you're paying or being paid to fly business class, uh, you're doing it in part because of productivity. Uh, you want to be productive on the plane, getting work done, but you also want to be productive at the other end, um, having had hopefully a good night's sleep or at least enough sleep, you can then hit the ground and uh, get on with the day's work. This flight, for instance, uh, left Kuala Lumpur late at night, 11.30, so you could do a full day's work there. And then you land at 5.30 in Heathrow, which gives you the chance to either get home, get washed, get into work, or depending if your work's got the facilities, um, have a shower and uh, at work and then get on with the day pausing every hour or so to tell people that you've just got off a flight and how tremendously productive and hard-working you are and how you hope that will be recognised in the next pay round. Having flown these two aircraft types almost back to back, the A350 over to Kuala Lumpur and then the A380 back, I suppose it does bring to mind what the comparison between the two are two are aircraft is and uh, which is preferable. It's a tough one because the A380 flyers it is very popular and having flown these two excellent aircraft one after the other you know I have to say that the A380 really does take some beating. Um, you just get so much more space. It is even quieter I think than the A350. Um, although this seat is nowhere near as new as the one on the A350 it's more spacious. Um, I guess the in-flight entertainment system is, you know, the previous generation on this A380 compared to the A350 one, but then, as I've said, I'm not that much into the in-flight entertainment. That's partly because I'm not in economy. If I was in economy not sleeping, I think I'd probably want more distractions. In business, you just tend to get on with what you need to do and then fall asleep. Um, I guess there's no Wi-Fi on board, uh, this one, although there could be if they retrofitted it. Um, but again, with Wi-Fi, I found the experience generally disappointing. I know there's new systems coming in, but uh, it's very expensive, very slow, and, and to be honest, since we are connected, however long we're awake, you know, 16, 17 hours a day, uh, it's no hardship for me to do without it. 
So if I had to choose between the two, A380. That's not su to suggest it's bad news that Malaysia is putting the A350 predominantly on the, the London route, turning the double daily A380 into a, eventually a double daily A350. You know, that's something they've got to do. It will make it economic, it will reduce capacity slightly, but make those seats, if not more affordable, more profitable for the airline. Um, because, uh, you know, the A350 is a very, very economical aircraft to run. Um, but in a comparison between the two, well, it's hardly a, it's the opposite of a rock and a hard place. They are both excellent experiences.